today is the last sort of you know theoretical session where we are going to discuss some ideas right. So, after that uh, after this what we are going to do is we are going to take the next couple of uh, classes and look at some case studies and essentially sort of look at what could have been done earlier which of these things that we have talked about from uh, uh, you know social network analysis, uh, power interest matrices to uh, uh, industrial ecology based thinking, design thinking. I mean how, what of all of this could we have possibly used on these cases right. So, we have three cases we have the Delhi airport, we have the Tirupur water supply and uh, I think the Mysore water supply uh, right. So, those are the three cases that we have. So, all of those three cases uh, will be cases that all of you prepare and submit and we will sort of through a draw of lots figure out who presents um, and so yeah. So, next uh, so next class we will. So, what we will do is uh, according to the schedule uh, we are supposed to do Delhi alone on um, Wednesday and then Mysore and Tirupur on Thursday. But past experience that sometimes it is difficult to do two classes uh, two cases in a class. So, we might do one and a half one and a half right. So, what I would like you guys to do is prepare Delhi and Mysore for Wednesday. Uh, if we can do Mysore great otherwise we will do Mysore and Tirupur for Thursday ok. So, that is the plan. So, everyone prepares Delhi and Mysore on Wednesday we pick one or two lucky groups and uh, we then do uh, Mysore if it is not yet done and Tirupur on Thursday right and again we pick uh, two lucky groups ok good. All right. So, today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, you know different sort of idea on what sort of incomplete design and polycentric governance and all of that. Uh, again what we will do is we will have uh, the presentations first and then a discussion. So, who is presenting today ok. So, both of you are presenting ok. Which of you is presenting the incomplete design paper all right. So, then you come second right. So, uh, so you go first and then uh, we will have a discussion and then we will get to uh, uh, the incomplete design paper ok. So, we are going to see on the strat uh, strategy capability for ma mega project architecture. So, in this uh, so, first of all me mega projects everything we are doing it to produce long lived capital intensive assist uh, the stakes are high and thus the like uh, new for infrastructure developments are done with their in, uh, inter organizational conflict. So, in this uh, case study we are going to see four me mega project in UK. So, three schemes were like London Olympics, uh, cross rail uh, cross rail and a high speed railway connecting London and North region and the fourth one will be a new terminal at Heathrow airport which was like financed by BAA the airport airports private owner. So, strategic capability for the major me mega project architect uh, though thus the strategic capability are built from a hier hierarchy of knowledge beginning at the task the specific and progressive integrated towards the bundles of routine which inform higher order decision making. To achieve a mutually consensual decision solution the promoter needs to set the organizational boundaries and integrate them into the network. Mega, mega project promoters need architecture knowledge to understand technical design for the infrastructure each of this architecture consists of a design structure and a task structure. So, the task structure of the mega project promoter is at uh, one set of the new infrastructure development the mega project promotes two phases two main tasks grow the organization network to attract much needed resources and other is develop a technical design of the new infrastructure. Me mega project promoter threats a precarious path on the one hand development cho choices in terms of technical issues and cost and uh, schedule forecast must be kept flexible enough to accommodate different preferences. On the other hand these choices must be robust enough to attain and maintain firm commitments from the first actors to join the networks. So, the capability to shape the mega projects the identification of potential members of the mega project networks is like technical bottle bottlenecks or technical constraints that hinder the performance of a system. So, strategic bottlenecks arise when a external party controls an irrep irreplaceable resource for system to function. The competency with which the promoter identifies the bottleneck as well as who controls the resources necessary to eliminate the bottlenecks impacts the capability to carry on the design tax. Uh, selection of the potential member of the mega project in many instances the decision is to join the network score rest solely with the re resource rich actors themselves as a process that is akin to self selection mechanism witnessed in the open network. The, me the mega project promoter therefore faces a trade off when mulling over giving dubious claimants access to the strategic decision making process and veto power on the final decision choices. The pitfalls to sequence the mega project network growth, the, the peri perils of the building large 
collective action herein is too fast. Example is the HS2 development is telling of this pitfall. Then the perils of the delaying arrival of powerful claimants. The case of the football club that gained de facto rights to directly influence the development of the Olympic Stadium right after the UK won the bid. Then is the risk of passing up time bound opportunities. So that is the examples of the London to like case of London 2012. The case of unforeseeable events upending strategic plans. So that is the major irritation that occurred less than two years away from the opening of Heathrow T2 after Star lost its key domestic airline. The four pitfall highlights that good reasons can exist not to implement an ideal sequence strategy even if some of the reasons are not universally accepted and indeed are more morally condemned by some observers. So conclusion of this is like design must be made the preference of the key resource rich actors. The promoters can't accurately specify the requirements until the network acquires its key core member. To perform their task well mega project promoters need to foster two strategic capability. First they need to cap be capable to identify which actor in the environment control which resources. Second the promoter needs to be capable to understand the architecture of the technical system and thus the resources necessary to eliminate the emerging bottlenecks. Next is the sustaining high, highly fragile consensus oriented developments. So in this the capital infill development of mega project underperform have fueled two views. One is the promoters underestimate the cost and the schedule targets because of the uh, strategic mis uh, presentation lack of planning. And I, again like they will not be planned because uh, uh, promoters are hostage to scope creep explanation of commitment. Uh, this research, uh, research adopts a multiple case study approach with the embedded units of analysis. Uh, this uh, research consists of same four mega project which we uh, saw in the last thing. Uh, this chapter will be will organized as follows. First we will be reviewing on the literature on the context oriented development. Then introduced to the methods they have done and the analysis analysis. And the chapter concludes with the discussion of that puts the, the sustainable, sustainability highly fragile consequence oriented developments. So if it comes to the research design sample and methods. Research uses a complicative case design in which cases are treated as independent experiment, experiment that confirm or so disconfirms the emerging six theoretical insights in the regression logic. Cases differ in the level of decomposition of the infrastructure. So if you see uh, decomposability uh, of the structures in the sense, for example, if you take uh, London Olympic uh, the park, it like it will be like different types of thing. There will be a football stadium, there will be a swimming pool, everything, which the designs will not be interlinked. But for that that thing, it will all be uh, like it will all be interdependent. But for example, if you take the uh, railway station or something, or everywhere, the design of thing will be the same. Same rail, like the same train is going to pass through all the stations, so it will be like somewhat interlinked. But if you take the case of airport and kind of thing, it will be like hyperlink, hyper inter, uh, interdependent. How in the sense, it's like if a runway and the tunnel of the people to get out will be, uh, it will depend upon the design of that both. But it will not be depending upon the parking and the hotel, which is which are outside. Next is like the design structure matrix, a tool from the design theory that allows representing a complex system into a square matrix by capturing in interdependencies between its constituent element. If the DMS has an entry in row i, column j, the decision concerning element i has a dire direct impact on the decision concerning j. Uh, if you take the D DSM analysis, can't however reveal how the issues are actually settled. Thus the D DSM analysis was complemented with the qualitative analysis of the raw data using coding and tabular displays. So if we come to the analyst part, the polycentric structure governing Punjab projects. The polycentricity is an intuitive approach to structure large collective action arenas that decentralize gover governance across an nested structure of centers of decision making and power and shared rules. In case of Olympic Park, the high level decision for one venue are ind independent of those decision of the other venue. Thus the Olympic Park is fairly pop populated of the component cluster. Uh, then comes the relaxing performance target. Uh, the aquatic uh, center is a good example. The budget was set at uh, 70 million pound in the 2004 prices. A figure insufficient to deliver icon venue. One year in the planning, budget has duplicated, and it like it keep on delayed. And at later by 2008, it came to like uh, 242 mil uh, million pound. Then is the flexible design structure. Okay, then the case of like London Olympic Stadium. Uh, like first they have a debate on whether they need to build one league for like football or football or like athletics uh, events kind of the ground and then the football uh, stadium was more viable in legacy but 
there was an alternative how to like just to invest 20 percent more money into the uh, ground and have a dual purpose but a uh, football enthusiast just pushed it pushed it back and just they built the football stadium uh, the role of the nested empires uh, in a sports an umpire is a person that acts as a referee and settle disputes between the players competing to win in me- mega project autonomous actors also strive to win fight over the design choices it turns out the presence of a structure of the nested umpires can put an, an end to the controversies that the parties fail to self self resolve umpires can exist at different institutional level some referees exist ex- exist outside the uh, project arena whereas other can be middle or lower level independent body created internally calling it a jack of all trades discussion uh like in this like i i would like to discuss about two mechanism together as a slippage in the performance targets we are also pre sequet to pro- produce f- flexible design slippage is in the form performance target inject oxygen critical to sustain a highly fragile development if the initial target turn out unrealistic and promoter would still stick to them the local problem would remain intractable in other cases relaxing the target in pre requested to allow for a risk neutral flexible design with a higher expect benefits for everyone the study is inclined uh, conclusive over whether the global buffer or or not a source of insufficiency as we can only speculate about the outcomes had buffers not have been there as the absence of an independent arbitrator increases the rise of the impasse power battles and the political maneuver but the presence of an alternative form of form to resolve conflicts also potentially create a negativity precondition of the parties to self resolve their differences thus the umpires also a source of in efficiency okay so i think a lot of information has been presented but i think the few threads need to be tied together on what all of this uh, means and where all of these nested umpires and flexible design and all of that comes in so uh, here we go so let me sort of provide also a little bit of context to uh, what we are trying to discuss okay so the first thing to sort of understand is that uh, we've been talking a lot about stakeholders right but if you forget external stakeholders and all of that and we just look at the project performance right in terms of time and cost there are there are enough statistics that show that projects are heavily delayed uh, right most projects are heavily delayed particularly these mega projects many of them are above budget so this is uh, you know there are many uh, um, uh, you know papers like this but you can see that uh, certain projects like the suez canal uh, was about uh, 1800% or 18 times uh, delayed um, down to projects that are only about 20% well on a 0 to 200 scale that's probably about 40% delayed uh, but when you look at the 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 value of these projects that's actually a very large number right so you have lot of delays and then you have all of these uh, you know peop- uh, people have written papers who have sort of said look uh, in about uh, number of uh, uh, 58 cases uh, cases in uh, in rail projects the average uh, cost overruns are 44% with a standard deviation of 38% and so 44% on a rail project rail projects are uh, you know several thousands of crores uh, right or whatever currency you change them in right so there is a lot of data that shows that these projects are uh, mega projects tend to be Uh, heavily delayed and have a lot of cost overruns right so that's the starting point now the question is what causes these delays and starting points right so uh, these delays and cost overruns so there's one person this guy uh, in the picture here his name is bent flyberg he is a professor at oxford university in the uk uh, and he has some reasons right so he says first he talks about something called optimism bias right so he says uh, fundamentally whenever human beings undertake a task we tend to be optimistic about Uh, how long it will take to complete right it's just sort of a psychological condition even if you are presented with data uh, right saying that uh, you know let's say you know it's possible to do an assignment in 3 hours but the data shows us that on average it takes people 5 to 6 hours to do this assignment right but still very often when you start uh, right you start with the gung ho optimism of of course i can do it in 3 hours it's possible to do it in 3 hours i can do it in 3 hours right so i'm i'm smart i'm dedicated all these other guys who took 5 6 hours there must have been some issue there uh, right maybe they had to take a break whatever but i can do it in 3 hours right so there is a, it's sort of a psychological condition it's been proven in uh, several sort of tests like this okay give you give you data on past performance sort of give you a minimum give you an average and people tend to be closer to the minimum right so the question is are we having the same kind of optimism bias in mega projects as well 
right? Yes, theoretically I can draw a construction schedule that can get this road completed in 12 months or 18 months, right? But uh, practically when I look at road projects, they typically tend to take 24 months because there is always a little bit of a problem with supply, material does not arrive on time or there is some uh, land acquisition issue, some permit issue, etc. Right? So, there are things that end up uh, delaying. But very often, you know, you have promoters that say, no, no, I am going to put my best sort of manpower on this project. I am going to really plan it. I am going to use all of these new age project management tools and therefore, I think I can complete it within. Uh, 12 months or 18 months. So, the question is are we and that essentially is an optimism sort of bias. So, question is, so Fleiberg says okay, maybe that is one of the reasons why projects are delayed. So, they are not really delayed, right. It is just that we are a little bit over optimistic in the prediction, uh, right. So, the uh, uh, you know road or power plant or whatever, actually the median time it takes is 30 months, but we in our optimism promise 24 months and against that promise of 24 months we are actually being delay, right. So, because the, the delay is always relative to a benchmark, right, relative to what you promise me is what I am going to mention uh, with regards to with, with what I am going to do to calculate the delay, okay. So, one is the optimism bias. Second one, uh, you know, uh, he says is also this, this notion of purposeful deception, where he says, look, it is not that I do not know that it will take 30 months, right, but I am saying 24 months for a purpose because I want to sort of start, uh, you know, and get the project done. If I told you it was 30 months, right, then maybe you would not want to do this project, right. So, if I told you what the real cost and time of the project were, then you might sort of have second thoughts. But if I, you know, tell you that, oh, it is actually only going to cost you 70 percent of what you think uh, and I could do it in 70 percent of the time, then perhaps I can hook you into doing this project. And once I hook you into doing this project, after I start the project midway, there is no point abandoning a bridge after uh, you know one span has been built, right. I mean you have to then go ahead and complete the bridge, right. So, uh, therefore, he talks about it as you know a very purposeful deception where I sort of lead you along and get to a point where you can't, you can no longer go back and therefore the project gets completed. Whereas, if I had actually told you the true cost of the project and the true time taken by the project, you might have said no in the first place. So, he says this is possibly another reason right, why there are cost and time overruns. Again, he says it is not really a cost and time overrun. I knew it would take 30 months or whatever, but I told you it would take 80 month, 18 months so that you would actually say okay to the project and then it ended up costing 30 months uh, or taking 30 months, but because we benchmarked at 18, right, I am seeing a cost overrun, right, so or a time overrun, right. So, that was that is another sort of reason. And the third thing he sort of talks about these, you know, what he calls these sublimes. Right. He says people get seduced into building things that uh, you know, so architects for instance like to build monuments to themselves, right. So, they like pointing at structures and say you know I built this structure. So, you can see all of these iconic structures you know uh, Frank Gehry builds the Guggenheim Museum uh, in Bilbao or you know some other architect builds something uh, else somewhere. So, you have all of these uh, you know the guy who built uh, you know the Sydney opera house is a Danish architect, right. So, people like to associate themselves with these iconic structures, right. And therefore, we tend to enter into projects which by necessity take a longer time to complete because they, they tend to be more complex, uh, right, than we give them credit for. So, again we go in saying, oh, based on the cubic volume of concrete, you know, this should take this long, but it is not pouring boxes, it is doing something sort of architecturally pleasing. Uh, similarly, engineers like building extremely complex uh, you know structures because again that is a testament to engineering, right. So, when you say what are the you know as an engineer what can you think about people talk about uh, uh, you know all of these wonderful bridges that span uh, you know large rivers, engineering marvels or structures, tall structures etcetera. So, you try to build things again the level of complexity of these things are high, predictability is low and therefore, you have uh, time and cost overruns, right. Uh, again people tend to build again large complex projects because you try to explain that the reason you are building them is for economic growth. So, there is no real economic growth if you build a couple of single story houses. Right, but if you build large metro rail systems, you're giving a lot of employment to people to build that system. Because of that, travel time is reducing for large numbers of people in the economy. Right, and so you have these multiplier benefits. And so, because of the pursuit of these kind of sublimes, he says we enter into particularly complex projects on which it is very difficult to figure out what the time estimates are because we haven't really done these kinds of projects before. And when you couple that with an optimism bias, we always end up starting with a low starting point. Right. So, normally when you say time overrun, right, when we say I expected you to finish at 12 uh, and you finished at 15 months or 18 months, right, what we seem to imply, uh, right, 
is that uh, there was some negligence in your part, right? That 12, the, the, the number 12 months that we selected was a fair sort of number. And you guys ended up taking 15 or 18, which means you did something wrong. You did something sort of poor. You didn't plan properly. You didn't execute with the right level of productivity, right? Your people were lazy. They were incompetent, whatever. There's a deficiency on your part, right? But all of these explanations say it's not a deficiency on your part. You just picked the wrong number to start with, right? The number should have been 15 or the number should have been 18. You picked 12, right? This is why if I ask you to estimate the time it would take you to run the 100 meters, right? And we all picked Usain Bolt's time. We will all be delayed, right. What you need to do is pick a time that is reasonable for, uh, you know, each one of you, uh, right, based on whatever other parameters, right. So, the analogy that sort of Fleiberg is making is, it is not that because you uh, ran at 12 seconds or 15 seconds does not mean you ran purposefully slowly, uh, right. It is just that you should have never benchmarked yourself on 9.6 seconds or whatever. Uh, you know, the world record is in the first place. You should have benchmarked yourself at 12 seconds, 13 seconds. Then if you ran at 15, then you did not perform optimally, um, right. So, he talks about all of these reasons for projects being delayed, uh, right, because you chose the wrong benchmark. You were highly optimistic, uh, you picked projects that were too complex, you could not find the right benchmark or you know the, knew the benchmark, but you purposefully did not sort of reveal it because you felt that if you know, for instance, if I go and tell an elected government it's going to take you seven years to finish this project, who in their right minds would approve it, right? Because you know that's in the next election term, right? And you may not really be there to cut the ribbon on the project. What is the gain to you, right? Whereas if I told you, no, no, we could do it in four years, then you're likely to approve it. And then at the end of the second year, if we say, boss, it's going to take a little bit longer, it's going to cost a little bit more, you've already spent so much money that you can't really back out, okay? So these are a set of explanations that Bent gives as to why projects are delayed, right? And what is the productivity that I will use, right, is comes down to a decision made by a single person, right. So, finally, when I come up with an estimate, uh, right, somebody is putting in productivities and that person is likely to be uh, optimistic, right, because and also they are likely to be aggressive because they want to win the project, right, particularly in a competitively bid scenario. People tend to be not only optimistic, they also tend to be aggressive because if I am pessimistic about durations and costs and actually put in real costs and real durations, I am likely to lose these kinds of bids, right. And there are actually studies that are showing that the more you lose, the more optimistic and aggressive you actually become, right. So, if I compete multiple times on various bids and I keep losing, right, then I start becoming more and more aggressive. So, what you see at an individual level holds perfectly true at an organizational level as well. And there is enough research, you can read Flyberg's works elsewhere to show that this is true. So, uh, as far as I can tell, what I have told you formally is, you know, the, the 12 months or whatever, right. Very difficult for you to establish that I knew that it was 18 months or 24 months ahead of time, but I did not purposefully say it at that time in order to deceive. Very difficult, uh, right. I will just come out and say, no, no, I mean, now I realize it's 24 months, but at the time I also thought it was 12 months because I looked at this project, I look at that project, whatever. So, there is very difficult right. If you can prove it, yeah, of course, but very, very difficult to prove the purposeful uh, deception. It is also, it is almost like, you know, we have talked about this when in, in sort of the Vadodara Hallol Toll Road case, right. The demand was highly uh, optimistic, right. Why was that? Perhaps it was, it could have been because of an optimism bias, right, because these guys, you know, picked a demand scenario and, and sort of picked the most optimistic scenario. But it could also have been because if I had given you the real picture, you might have never PPP'd this project in the first place, right. So, I needed to give you a picture where there is a 15 percent rate of return that you will PPP it as well. But now, how do I go back and say you purposefully deceived me as opposed to you made an honest mistake that anyone is capable of making? Right. So, that is a good point. Liquidated damages is there exactly for that purpose, right. But if you look at most liquidated damages clauses, they cap off at a certain point, right. Normally, it is 0.5 percent of contract value or whatever. Beyond that cap, the LDs do not really kick in, okay. So, yes, there are safeguards against uh, doing this purposefully, but again, it depends on who you are talking about, right. The contractor, for instance, yes, is, is, is you know, succumbs to the LD, but the architect does not. And the architect is the one that sort of created the project, came out with the initial BOQ and all of those kinds of things, right. So, the point here is these are some explanations, okay. They are all somewhat reasonable explanations, right. I mean, you can sort of think about them and rationalize that each of these could be happening, okay. Mm -hmm.